Dive into God's Word. Dig a little deeper. Discover the Bible's message for you today. Hello, thank you for joining me today. You are listening to or watching Deeper, your daily Bible study. Our topic today is titled Genesis versus Paganism. We'll be looking at um, some things that God creates on day four of Creation Week and why Moses, the author of Genesis, refers to them the way that he does. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day of life that you have given to us and whatever may be going on with us, with our families uh, today. We thank you for the time to uh, stop for just a moment and uh, focus ourselves on you and on your word. We pray for your Holy Spirit's leading and guidance as we do this. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis chapter 1. We're going to uh, read what God does on day number 4. This is from Genesis chapter 1, uh, verse 14 and onward through 19. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And verse 19 concludes day four by saying, the evening and the morning were the fourth day. So on day four, God creates these heavenly bodies that uh, provide light for the earth. The stars are mentioned by name. The sun and the moon are not. They are simply referred to as the greater light and the lesser light. And the question asked in today's lesson or addressed in today's uh, lesson is, why is that the case? Why didn't the author of Genesis, Moses, uh, say on day four, God created the sun? Uh, he created the moon and he created the stars. Why use these other phrases like the lesser light and the greater light? Uh, the answer suggested uh, is that Moses was trying to uh, direct people's attention away from those heavenly bodies themselves and keep the focus of the passage on the Creator, on God Himself. It's a good explanation because uh, paganism throughout the entire history of this world has uh, been based in part in large part at times, on the worship of the sun, especially uh, even on the worship of the moon. For example, in Ezekiel's time, we see this vision that God gives to Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter 8. And God is leading him through the sanctuary, through the temple here, uh, again in vision, and showing him greater and greater abominations, reason why uh, God has allowed his people to be taken captive by the Babylonians. And God finally shows him the greatest abomination of all of these abominations. And we read now from Ezekiel chapter 8. I'll begin in verse number 15. Then God said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces towards the east, and they worshipped the sun towards the east. This wasn't the first time in Israel's history that they had been uh, tempted with sun worship, certainly not the first time uh, in, in uh, history of paganism or the pagan influence on God's people where this was an issue. But this was the greatest abomination that God was showing Ezekiel at this time. Certainly something that God did not want his people involved in. And, um, you know, having grown up in Egypt, Moses would have been very familiar with the Egyptian religions. Uh, he would have, uh, you know, been surrounded by the sun worship as part of the, those ancient Egyptian religions. And so as he's writing out Genesis, he is trying to, again, deflect uh, the reader's attention away from those bodies themselves. He doesn't name them as the sun and the moon simply refers to them as the greater light and the lesser light, uh, thereby perhaps trying to keep the focus on the Creator, on God. Uh, it's interesting when we look at some 
uh, statements in, historic, in, in books on history that uh, we read, uh, for example, in Fawcett's Bible Dictionary, um, page 666, uh, this statement, sun worship was the earliest idolatry. And so as we go back in paganism, as we go back in uh, idolatry, uh, we see sun worship right at the, the origin uh, of mankind's slip away from God. Uh, this statement is from A.T. Jones in his book, Empires of the Bible, page 42. He says, quote, It is almost impossible to find in the history of the world a form of idolatry that is not connected with sun worship. And in almost every nation, sun worship has been the principal worship, so that it may, be, uh, so that it may fairly be described as the universal worship. Again, that's from A.T. Jones in his book, Empires of the of the Bible. So sun worship has been a problem um, for people ever since uh, we have fallen into sin. And Job had an interesting statement. It was really a question. Job chapter 31. If you have your Bible, please turn with me. Uh, I've always felt that uh, hearing the Bible read is important, but when you can read it yourself, it's even better, even more uh, lasting in its impact. So Job chapter 31 verses 26 through 28. If I beheld the sun when it shined, or the moon walking in brightness, and my heart hath been secretly enticed, or my mouth hath kissed my hand, this also were an iniquity to be punished by the judge, for I should have denied the God that is above. Uh, as in so many other areas of life, friends, we cannot worship God and anything else. This is why the very first commandment is, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Job is bringing this point out here, isn't he? You know, if I had been enticed to worship the sun or the moon or anything else for that matter, uh, this would be iniquity that would uh, be judged by the judge in the day of judgment. And um, he ends again, I should have denied the God that is above. You know, so often in our lives we... We fall into the trap of thinking that we can serve ourselves, at least partly, and serve God, maybe mostly. And we simply can't do that. You know, Jesus said you cannot serve two masters. And it may not be sun worship, per se, or moon worship that is um, your great temptation. It may not be my great struggle or temptation. We can struggle with other things. And we can often be um, tempted by Satan with the thought, oh, it doesn't matter. This is a small thing. You can do this and you can still serve God. Uh, Jesus was clear. Again, you know, you have to choose me or you have to choose the world. And um, just as Moses here in Genesis chapter 1 apparently is trying to really draw the distinction between the Creator and the things that are created, saying worship the Creator, not the things that are created. Just as Moses so clearly draws that distinction, we need to prayerfully do this in our own lives too, don't we? To draw that, that distinction between um, who should be created and everything else that should not be worshipped or served in our own lives. Let's move on now, um, looking at the concept of sun worship. Again, we read from Fawcett's Bible Dictionary that sun worship was the earliest idolatry. We're going to see the reason why that is the case in these next few verses. In Isaiah chapter 14, we read about Lucifer's fall in heaven. And uh, verse 12 begins this way, how art, thou fall, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. It's often been said that Lucifer had an eye problem. He couldn't see clearly. All he could see was himself. And as he did that, as he allowed that focus to continue and to strengthen in his life, um, he imperceptibly, step by step, uh, began turning away from God. Now, the name Lucifer literally means light bearer. And as we keep that in mind, we'll turn to our next text, um, a well-known text which describes Lucifer's fall also, and that is Ezekiel chapter 28. 
And we read here about how God created Lucifer, and it's a really an amazing description. Um, Ezekiel 28, verse 12, says this, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. God created this angel perfect without any sin. Sin is the devil's fault. It's not God's fault. Verse 13 goes on to give us a description of this incredible angel. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. And now it's going to list all of these precious stones. The sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. Imagine all of these precious stones of you know, so many different colors uh, forming, at least in part, the covering of this incredible angel. And what was Lucifer's job? We read just in the next verse, uh, Ezekiel 28, verse 14, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Lucifer's job was to stand beside the throne of God, just like those golden cherubs in the earthly sanctuary were positioned uh, on both sides of the Ark of the Covenant with God's glory, that Shekinah glory, glowing from between them. Lucifer's job, where God placed him, was one of those covering cherubs. And imagine the scene as this angel, covered in these precious stones and gold, stands in the incredibly glorious presence of God. Imagine the prisms and the rainbows that would have been cast off around the throne of God. God created Lucifer to reflect the light of his glory. And Everything was well as long as Lucifer was content to reflect the glory of God. At some point in history, he began looking at himself, and he forgot that he was merely reflecting God's glory, and he thought, wow, I'm pretty bright. I'm shining with my own glory, so he thought. And it was at this point that sin begins, and the great rebellion of sin starts. And so Lucifer, the light reflector, now becomes Lucifer, the light bearer. And he forgets that he is reflecting God's glory. He is uh, believing now that he is shining with his own glory. And this is why sun worship is the earliest idolatry. Because <clears throat> as Lucifer begins and now extends this rebellion from heaven, uh, now down to earth as well, he wants the worship, right? That's what Isaiah tells us. He wants the worship, the glory that is due to God. And so he picks the one object uh, in creation that is visible to man here on earth that best represents who he feels like he is, and that is light itself. And he picks the sun, and he says, the sun will represent me. And if I can get people to worship the sun, they will, of course, ultimately be worshiping me and not worshiping God. And this is why sun worship is the earliest idolatry. You know, in the book of um, 2 Corinthians, Paul is writing about uh, end-time events and how Satan will present himself to the world. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 4, we read this. I have to go to 2 Corinthians, not 1 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 4. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached... Or if ye receive another spirit which you have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. As I'm reading this, I'm realizing that's not the verse I was intending to read. Um, so I apologize for that. We'll try to correct that in the study guides. But Paul writes that Lucifer, or Satan, is transformed into an angel of light. And at the very end of time, he will uh, present himself in dazzling brightness and sweep much of the world away in apostasy and rebellion with him. Well, friends, we don't want to be swept away. We want to remain loyal and faithful to the Creator God in heaven. And so we must worship him each and every single day. Um, and praise God that we have a loving Creator that uh, is worthy of our worship. Thank you for joining me today, and please join me again tomorrow.